So I welcome all, all of you to our uh, third lecture in our lockdown series. And soon we surely are going to be not locked down. And uh, thank you all for uh, making uh, the meetings a success. And uh, today I bring to you my own professor from uh, college days. And let me um, um, ask her to start her video. And once she com comes online, uh, at this point, all of you can switch off your videos. Uh, yeah, Rajiv. Uh, please switch your videos off. I'm trying to bring her to the main uh, speaker section. Okay, so uh, I welcome Dr. Nilima Chidgopikar. Uh, she was uh, my dearest professor when I was doing my master's years ago. I think it was back in 1998 in Delhi University. And um, we had this course called um, uh, uh, Study of Religions. And uh, the first day when she entered our class, I was just mesmerized. And you will know why. And uh, trust me, you will know why. Uh, her uh, breadth of knowledge and how she inspired me to be a, a good orator, which I feel I am, a, I'm okay. Uh, but thanks to her, uh, to her tutelage. And I've kept in touch with her all these years uh, with her work and what she does. She's an inspiration to me. And I'm so happy that she's here and that I was able to, you know, invite her for this. And thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Chit Gopikar, for doing this for us and uh, taking us to the world of Shiva. And uh, with that, um, I'll, I'll leave the stage for you. But I do want to say she is uh, an associate professor at Jesus and Mary College in Delhi University. Uh, she's a very well-known speaker. She's uh, um, uh, delivered lectures all over uh, in England and the US and uh, virtually with us now. So, uh, Dr. Chit Gopikar, please um, take the stage and um, um, let's begin. And I think all of you have to switch your videos off, please. Um, yes. Is, is Sonali, is that okay now? Can you all hear me? Sonali. Oh. Sorry. Uh, yes, uh, we can hear Sonali. you. Oh, you can hear me? And, and can, uh, so uh, am I going to have this kind of, uh, Sonali, am I going to have this kind of vision of the screen? I can start. You can start, we can hear you. Okay, fine. No, this is means just this. Okay, okay it's beginning. No, 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 no. Enter. Oops. Um, enter full screen, enter full screen. Yeah, great. Um, I think that's a good start. Okay, I, I'm really sorry if this, uh, can everybody see me and hear me? Yes. We can hear okay, you, so we can see you on enough. the big screen. Okay, 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 okay. So good afternoon to everybody. And I am extremely delighted to be here today and delighted that you all have joined me on this Sunday afternoon. And uh, it's, uh, I'm really very thankful to Sonali, to Dr. Sonali Gupta, the director of the Himalayan Institute for inviting me. Uh, very kind of her and, uh, and thank you Sonali for your kind words. And um, yes, I would like to now take you to, or take you on a passage to Shiva. Now, uh, Shiva, so this is how I would like to uh, introduce to you. I have a, a limited time, so I'm going to try and introduce certain aspects of Shiva to you. And I hope there will be questions and that you would get as enthralled by him as I have been over the last so many decades. Now, it often, it often appeals to me that somebody should one day ask me, 
tell me one, one major point that you can make about the Indic civilization, about India. Make one point about India, which you don't have to add caveats to. Something that you can say in a magisterial way, or you can say in an imperious way and say, yes, I don't need to say this is a generalization. This is true. And if someone were to ask me that, I would, I would say that India loves numbers. India loves multiplication. India lives in huge numbers of everything, everything from the abstract to the mundane. So like to give you an example, we all know there are so many languages in India. There are so many dialects in India. There are so many cuisines in India. There are so many dance forms in India. There are so many of everything in India. It's like we sort of like celebrate numbers. That's what it seems like. So why should the religious sphere be left behind? There are so many gods, goddesses, demigods, semigods, godlings in India that it is absolutely baffling. It is absolutely mind boggling. And when the number is put across 33 million, it's apocryphal. It's kind of like exaggerated. But at the same time, it appears that, yes, maybe it must be because when we go around, we see Every family, the Kul Devta is there, every village, Gram Devta is there, Gram Devi is there, the town has a God, the city has a God, the country has a God. Each individual is allowed to choose their own Ishta Devta so individuals can have their gods. So yes, there are multiplicity of gods and goddesses, no doubt about that. And then there is Shiva. Shiva, one of the major gods, out of those 33 million, if, if the number is there, Shiva is one of the major gods. Who, why we are so interested in him is that he seems to appear from the earliest times. As historians, we look at the earliest times, the earliest text that was there, and he seems to be so popular today. Like a, it's like he's like a stone gathering moth. It's like he's a moth. He's like been moving along and gathering a whole lot of different elements and different characteristics to him. And it's absolutely fascinating to see how he's grown from being one type of God to another type of God to hundreds of different types of gods. Because it's not just Shiva. He starts off by being Rudra, then there's Shiva, then there's Dikshatan, then there's also Bhairav, there is also uh, you know, Arthanarishwara, there is Nataraj. There are so many types of Shiva, so many manifestations, so many, so many kinds of representations of Shiva. Now, we wonder, I mean, that's why he's so unique, because he's the first God who had all these different representations, who are all but Shiva, just different forms of him, appearing in different forms of time, appearing in different mythology. But we wonder, how did these various numbers come about, and how did he become such a great, like, how did he become a God who has so many different manifestations? And that's where his uniqueness lies, because we find that he is there, right there in the earliest text, that is the Rig Veda. And I have to go into that, you know, his, historians tend to look at sources and the Rig Veda is our main source for the period 1500 to 1000 BC. Prior to that, we do have the Indus civilization. We do know that around circa 3000 BC, there appears to be a God that who could have been Shiva, but we're not entirely sure. The, script being undeciphered till this day. So we don't know whether it was Shiva or not. It seems like it's it's somebody seated in the small seals. You see somebody seated in a yogic asana, which may have been Shiva, but we're not entirely sure. But we come on to slightly firmer ground when we come to the Rig Veda, which is a text, a, a text full of prayers, full of hymns. And it will love it because they look at it they look at the number of hymns that are there for each god and they seek the popularity of the god historians have also done that they've looked and seen they've counted the hymns and found how many hymns are dedicated to god so the popularity of a god now Shiva, in fact is not even mentioned there who is mentioned is what later on becomes and is understood as an epithet of shiva that is rudra so Rudra is there as Shiva, not yet Shiva. Shiva, in fact, is an adjective that is used for various gods. And it's, you know, Shiva means propitious, Shiva means kind. And Rudra is just the opposite. Rudra means it comes from the root word Rud, and Rud also has to do with the English word rude, the wood, howling winds, the tempest, the storms, lightning, everything that is scary. So in fact, when you hyphenate Rudra Shiva, it's like an oxymoron. Uh, you know, Shiva is pleasant, kind, and, you know, auspicious, propitious. And there you have Rudra, which is scary and everything that is frightening. So when we look at Rudra and we compare him with the other Vedic god, gods, the Rig Vedic gods, like Indra, who has the maximum hymns dedicated to him, something like 300. And then we have Varun and we have Agni and they all have so many hymns dedicated to each one of them. 
Shiva has a mere, or Rudra has a mere two and a half hymns dedicated entirely to him, and he has some 75 casual references. But more interesting is to see how is he depicted? Is he anywhere near the Shiva that we know today, who stands around with the Trishul, who has a wife, who has a Vahan Nandi, who has two sons? No, nothing like that. And that is why it is so interesting to see how Shiva mythology and a lot of Hindu mythology has been evolutionary. It sort of like grew along with the different centuries and expanded. So to go back to the first earliest signs of Rudra, or the earliest signs of Shiva, we find that he is a howler. We find that he is, doesn't have his trishul, but he has a bow and arrow. We find that he is shooting his arrows to different people, to children, to pregnant women, to uh, cattle. And all the prayers that are there in the hymns, interestingly enough, are just appeasing, trying to appease his anger. He's got a lot of froth in him. He's got a lot of anger in him. And they're trying to appease his anger. And they're trying to, it's like, uh, uh, it's like appeasement through flattery, like Arendt and Dekar said that, you know, they're trying to flatter him and say, oh, you're the greatest, oh, you're the mightiest, oh, you're the strongest. We have seen you. And that's where the mountains come in. We have seen you behind, lurking behind the mountains. We have seen you, you scary, you're fearsome form. We are all very scared of you. Please, please save us from your, save us from you. Yeah, you're so, so fearsome that save us from you, save us from the, your darts, save us from your arrows. And so this kind of beseeching is going on in the, in the Big Veda. And what is surprising is that when we come towards, the, the, after a few centuries go by, we find that this Rudra is changing and met, uh, metamorphosing into Rudra Shiva, and finally Shiva becomes a, becomes a main, main epithet, and Shiva is one who is going to be then a dancer. He is going to be a married man. He's going to have Parvati slash Durga as his wife. He's going to have Ganesha and Skanda Kartikeya as his sons. Now, how did this happen? Now you can say, okay, why are you relying just on one text, Rig Veda? Surely there were other texts. No, there may have been other texts, but they have not survived. So we are depending on it, but we are completely, completely uh, cognitive of the fact that there may have been other texts and maybe other people, and maybe Rudra was mentioned there as Shiva with a wife or anything, but we don't have that. We also have scant archaeological data for this period. So we have to just think that, yes, this was Rudra. He has some characteristics that we see even today in Shiva, but in many ways he has transformed. He has transformed, if you can use that term. He has completely changed. And yet he's retained some things. And I want to tell you what he's retained because it's very interesting. We're today you know, in a, in a complete disease-filled world. And it seems that Shiva, or let's say Rudra, in the Rig Veda was the physician of all physicians. He was the mightiest physicians. He, physician. He knew about disease, but he was the one who would give disease. He was the one whom, if you appease, he would take away the disease. So this whole idea, which you hear later on with certain goddesses like Shitala Mata, Shitala Mata gives you the measles. See, Shitala Mata gives you chicken pox, but if you appease to her, she, if you appeal to her, you, you, you pay obeisance to her, then she will take it away from you. This whole concept that a god gives and god takes away is already there in the Rig Veda and it's already associated and you can already see it there with Rudra. So that's one thing that's very interesting. And also what's interesting is I try to look and see why does he get so angry? He gets so angry uh, because he doesn't like it if you mention him along with other gods. So this whole idea that Shiva is, you know, is demanding a kind of theism, some kind of personal devotion. So he doesn't like it if you, if you say it's like it's called Sahuti. He doesn't like it if you are uh, uh, you're praising him along with other gods. He also doesn't like faulty praise that is Dushtuti. So he doesn't like that either. And that's one thing that can anger him. Besides that, we don't really know what angers him. But one would think as, as history students that he was Veda Bhaya, we hear that, that is outside the Vedas. So he was probably, he was probably marginalized. He probably belonged to the marginal groups. He, if we can believe that the Vedic, uh, the, uh, the Aryans came into this country, maybe they met the autochthonous people. Maybe he was a divinity of the autochthonous people. We are not entirely sure, but there is a very strong possibility because he's looked upon in a derogatory way. He's looked upon as a person who's not to take part in the sacrifices. But as we go on and we go to the Yajurveda, a little period shortly after this, we find that there are already 100, 100 
<clears throat> names given to Rudra and he's becoming slowly, slowly popular. He's still feared, but he's getting popular. And soon when we come to around 500 BC, he is being referred to as Rudra Shiva and finally just as Shiva. But when he becomes Shiva, then he gets associated with Kali. He gets associated with Kali, of course, he gets associated with Durga, he gets associated with Parvati, Ganesha and Skandakartikya. Now, this, how he gets associated is a process. It is a historical, so sociological process that takes place. We have to think of it as the Brahmins wanting to maintain their hegemony over the people. So what they do is, what, what has been called by Evan Srinivas, he's called, he called it Sanskritization. What is happening is we see a two-way process working. The Brahmins adapt a divinity who is popular like Buddha Shiva and then brings it into its fold through iconography, through mythology, and then bring in different other divinities who may be in the periphery. We see, we see Ganesha coming in only around 5th century AD. We see uh, Parvati coming in much later when, when the Purans are there, she comes in as the spouse of Shiva. So I find this whole process, which has been called the Puranic process, extremely interesting because we move away from the Vedas, now we go on to the Purans. And when you come to the Purans, there are all these you know, 36 Purans, which are filled with, our, which are replete with so so much of mythology, so many myths about Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma, the goddess, and they're all talking about, they're very sectarian, so each one is talking about their chosen god. And uh, Shiva is put forward as now he's got his anger there, but he's angry for a reason. And the reasons are explained. He has a lot of, uh, he has a lot of love for his wives, first Pati and then Parvati. And that is then explained. How did Parvati come into the fold? Who was she? Was she a great goddess to begin with? And then it is explained about Ganesha. So it's very interestingly done. But just in case you get the impression that Everything went on very smoothly and this is a process that I'm just making up and it was smooth. No, no way was it smooth. There was evidence of tension. There was evidence of cultic tension taking place, cultic sectarian tension taking place, for instance, between Shiva and Parvati, between Shiva and Ganesha, between Shiva and Vishnu. And that's where the mythology comes in. That's where we, if we analyze mythology, not just like stories, but look at them for some kind of historical evidence, then we can find that these gods, this god, this god is representing two different spheres, representing two different people have had to come together. Like for instance, one of the pictures that I showed, in, uh, which is which Sonali put up, uh, the Ardhanari Shwara, the whole idea that Shiva is also the androgen, the, the, the great androgen, the, you know, the, the god androgen. So he has his half, his left half is occupied by Parvati and the right half is occupied by Shiva. And so he, everybody just loves it, all this shows bisexuality, what a wonderful way to have of God, how wonderful it is that Shiva represents that. And I just want to say a lot of things. Shiva represents a lot of things, actually. He represents a lot of the cliches that are associated with uh, with uh, India, for instance. Yeah, I mean, all the markers like yoga, he's the Mahayogi, or dance, you know, where everybody says, oh, there's so many dances in India, so many art forms. He's Nataraj, or like... And, and androgyny, you know, it's such a big thing all over. There's a whole theory about it. He represents the andro androgynous element. So here, we know, we know that the first androgynous, uh, the first Ardhanarishwara came about around the Kushan period. We see a sculpture, it's about first century CE. Now, that came about and then later on we see lots of images, you know, with one form of Shiva and half of it is the left half is occupied by Parvati and the right half is occupied by Shiva. So there's one breast, there's one, you know, sometimes even the phallus is shown half, you know, Shiva's side and the earrings are different. The Jatamukuta is on the side of Shiva. Parvati has beautiful coiffed hair with a nice earring. He has snakes, that's his earrings. He has snakes over here. She has a lovely necklace here. Beautiful Ardhanarishwara. Incidentally, Ardhanarishwara. Parvati doesn't figure there at all. It is actually the Lord that it's Ishwar that is Shiva who is half Nari that is woman. So we can see that maybe the first image Parvati didn't play a role and later on we started think, seeing her, him as having Parvati there. Now I searched the Purans, I scoured the Purans to see what kind of myth is telling us why did this Adhanarishwara form come about. In my mind, I could tell that it must be something. It couldn't have been just 
the, the, the craftsmen decided to make this god, this particular god, half Parvati and half Shiva. And wonderfully, I managed to find in Gopinath Rao's book, just, he, just, he just said it's Tamil, Tamil folklore. He didn't say that this is from this Quran or anything. He just said Tamil folklore. So I grabbed it. And it's this wonderful tale, which I'm just going to tell you very briefly over here. And, and, and I'll indicate to you how you can see sectarian tension between the two of them. So Parvati is a great goddess. She's been brought into the fold of Shiva. She's very often unhappy because of Shiva's own wanderings and Shiva's lifestyle and things like that. She was in love with him, but she also has problems with him and they bicker over various things, which is very colorful and very robust and lovely to read about and hear about. So the two of them are standing there in court and all the worshippers one by one are coming and paying obeisance to the two of them. Shiva is the great Mahadev, she is the great Mahadevi and everybody is bowing down to them and going away, circumambulating them and going away offering their puja. And then comes one particular very devout worshiper of just Shiva. He comes and he sees the two of them standing there and he only circumambulates Shiva and he goes away. Parvati is enraged. She's not like the other goddesses that you hear who are, you know, very submissive. She is enraged. She said, how can her ego is like, she's such a great goddess on her own. She's Durga, she's Kali. How can they do that to me? So she goes away as, as is the want of most gods and goddesses. She goes away into the forest, into the mountains to do tapasya and to do, you know, asceticism, a lot of hard rigor, ardor, you know, with great ardor. She does it for many hundreds of years and Shiva when she's finished, Shiva says, ask for a boon, whatever you want, I will give to you. So she said, oh, but you know, Shiva, you are my husband. I love you so much. Can I please be joined with your body? In her mind, she had this whole idea that when I'm joined with his body, then devout worshippers of only Shiva will have to circumambulate me as well. So the two of them, he says, yes, you've done so much of this. You know, he's Bholenath. He's the great one who grants all wishes. He said, come join into my body. They become one with a line in between and the join completely like I explained earlier, they become Arthanarishwara. They stand in court and again, all the followers, one by one, all the bhaks come and circumvent, ah, oh, look at this, look at the glory, look at the leela of this God, look at him. And they circumambulate the two of them and bow to them and go away. Then comes Bhringi. Now guess what Bhringi is pugnacious. Bhringi only likes Shiva, loves Shiva. So he does not circumambulate and he goes away and Parvati is angry, but she says, okay, that's it. Now, what does he do? He goes and does his tapasya, asks Shiva, when Shiva tells him, what boon do you want? He says, I want to become a bee. Now, sometimes I read about it, it's a bee or Bhringi in Kannada is like a beetle. Anyway, an insect who could, who's had very sharp antenna or whatever. So he becomes a bee, he comes back at the court, comes to them, pierces the hole between Shiva and Parvati and circumambulates only Shiva and goes away. Now in my books when I wrote the biography of Shiva, I said, oh my God, Parvati is enraged and she doesn't know what to do. That, you know, how, can, how can you ignore me? How can you be so mean to me and not want to circumambulate me? But that's all in the story and it makes everyone laugh and everyone feel delighted with the story of Shiva and Parvati. But we as historians see it as some kind of sectarian rivalry going on between the sects of Shiva and the sects of Parvati, the people who are following Parvati, the people who are following Shiva. So this is one way of looking at myth, not looking at it as something that doesn't reflect the society because Myths are the longings of human beings. Myths do reflect society. So that is one example of, of Arthanarishwara. And another example that I can give you again, which shows the rivalry and, and the kind of tension between Shiva and Parvati. See, one way you can just say, oh, it's the tension between husband and wife. And you can say, and that's one thing I really like about Shiva, actually, that he's such a mighty God. He's so much into his asceticism. He is He's got such absolute uh, uh, philosophy, which is sometimes very difficult to declutter. It's so, so dense and so difficult to understand. But at the same time, he is such a family man and he is such an ordinary man. He is such a human being. Very often when you read the myths, and that's the charm of Shiva, that he can be there and he can be here as well. He can be the great universal rule uh, God and he can be the local God over here. Appeal. He appeals, therefore, to all the peoples. So to get back to one more myth about Shiva and Parvati, which also illustrates this tension and is also the photograph is there on the poster which Sonali so nicely made is the time that Shiva and Parvati are playing Chaucer. Now again uh, we hear that Shiva when Parvati gets married to Shiva she goes to Mount Kela she's living over there she herself is Parvat, Parvati Parvat of the mountains she's very used to the mountains but she goes there and she misses her family and she misses her life but they 
you know, keep doing things to engage themselves. They make love for many years. They adorn each other with flowers. They, we, we hear they go into aquatic sports. All this is written in the Qurans, the Shukh Quran, the Ling Quran. They, they go, you know, riding on, bull, on the bull that is on Nandi. They sort of like always are doing things to entertain themselves. One thing that they do do to entertain themselves as well is to play board games. And so they play Chaucer, which some people have said is the beginning. It's a, it's, you know, it's a game like that, which some, some have said chess has come from there. It's a precursor to chess. So they play Chaucer and mostly because Shiva, you know, these are Shiv Purans, uh, like Ling Puran, Vaman Puran, they, they emphasize Shiva's greatness. So in most Purans, when I read this, because you know, all the Purans, we talk about the same myth in a different way. Most Purans, when I read it, they said, oh, you know, Shiva is the greatest and he always defeats and that's all very good and that's all very well and you know I kept reading 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 and I finally came across a Quran in which the same scene is being played out the two of them are playing Chaucer Shiva and Parvati and Shiva has his minions there he has Narad Muni there he has all his friends over there and they're just cheering him on and saying come on Shiva you can do it you can do it and she's there lonely on her own sitting by herself and she's you know with the dice in her hand and she's throwing the dice and she's playing over there and believe it or not she starts winning the game now there's a everyone is really hassled over here how can Parvati win the game against the great Shiva so she starts winning the game and finally she wins and there's a pin drop silence so she says now now look at her now this is what is shocking that she says this she says, you know, now that I've won the game, I think we need to take off that Chandra that, you know, that he's, you know, after all, he has the, his Chandra Shekra, he has the moon on his head, you know, there's, there's a whole myth about that. He loves his moon. She says, take it off and give it to me. And it's written there in the Quran that she takes it and she actually annulates it. She makes a hole in it and she puts it on as an earring. Then she looks at him again. Now, you know, Shiva doesn't wear much. Okay. So he has his, his snakes slithering up and down his chest. She knows he likes the snakes. She says, Give me those snakes and you know with disgust on her face give me those face snakes so he takes off the snakes she puts them on one side then she keeps looking at him now his chest is bare his ash is smeared he's got jada mokota okay what does he have underneath the skirt of a tiger skin sometimes it's of a lion skin sometimes tiger sometimes antelope and sometimes even an elephant okay so he's got the tiger skin and she says take off the tiger skin skirt of yours and then he looks at her and he says, how can you, all the time he was quiet, he said, how can you even make me do that? Don't you know I'll become nude? And she says, so what is it to you? You roam around in jungles nude. You are sort of like going around enticing the sages' wives. She talks about another myth in another period. And he said, you know, you went around nude and you have no shame. And she just gives it to him. And I am absolutely shocked that such a myth can be there. This kind of conversation can be there between Shiva and Parvati. And finally she gives in. She says, keep it on. I don't want it. Just keep it on. But no, I am victorious. Now, again, look at it as a story. It's a wonderful, it's a delightful story. Or look at it as reflecting some kind of cultic tension between these two people. Because we see it in Arjuna Ishwara. We see it between these two gods, sorry. We see it in this, this Chaucer thing. We see it when Ganesha is decapitated. We see it when Shiva doesn't recognize Ganesha, doesn't like the fact that Parvati has her own son. So, you know, myths can be seen in many different ways. And Shavik myths, if you notice, the maximum myths are with Shiva and they're living myths. I mean, and they're pertaining to Shiva. They're living myths. They're not in India. They're not myths that people are going to forget about. They're going to remember it. Or even if you look at the Lingod Bhavmurti, the Lingod Bhavmurti is the Ling. Shiva is the only God associated with phallicism. Look at the link. Again, how did the link come about? The whole story behind the, the link shows so much of tension between three major gods. Shiva, who's not taking part in it right now, Brahma and Vishnu. Brahma and Vishnu each saying that we are the greater and they're fighting with each other. And this is all written there. there I, I remember I wrote about this in one of my books. I said, uh, they fight like goats. Like, I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest, and my publishers got so hassled. They said, take it away. I said, no, it's there in the Purans. You can see the translation. You can see it in, in the Puran. I'll give you the exact footnote. They fought like goats. And finally, everyone, the people went and beseeched Shiva that, please come and save us, because these two gods are fighting who's the greatest. Come. So he comes in the form of a flaming pillar of fire. And he comes over there, and they have to go to the bottom and to the top, and they can't see it. And Brahma tells a lie that I actually reached. I actually reached the top sorry I, yes i actually reached the top he told a lie and then the arrest of daughter you know what happens in the, in the purans they give them a reason why is brahma not worship 
why is why does Brahma not have enough temples? Oh, one of the reasons is because he told a lie over there and Shiva punished him that you told a lie. You said you reached when, when actually link, the Ling, it's like it represents Shiva. He has no beginning. He has no end. Shiva is supposed to be Aja, never born never die and that's one of the reasons he says that i don't want to have a child that is the reason why he did not want to conceive a child did not want to have ganesha and parvati was very keen to have it because he said people men like to have you see in the purans there's a lot of what's happening in the society it tells us a lot about the society men want to have children because they want them to light the funeral fire i have never been born i will never die i don't need a child and so she goes and makes it herself. It's part from the genetically, she goes and makes the, uh, the, doesn't have the child through actual sexual intercourse with Shiva, but makes him herself. There's a whole lot of stories behind the way she makes Ganesha. So what I'm trying to say here is that the vast numbers that we see in Shiva, in his various manifestations, uh, as in either when he's Ugra, that he's angry in his head of a form, when you see him walking around nude with bulbous eyes as, he's, as if he's been drinking and he is supposed to be taking hallucinogens, or then you see a completely con a contrasting image of Shiva when he's so peacefully sitting like this, just, you know, and, and meditating as the meditating God, just sitting peacefully with his hands one on top of the other in this wonderful Sukhasan and with his eyes half shut, whether he's meditating, whether whether he's Pera, whether he's Vankeshwara, where you find him so tribal to look at the kind of way Vankeshwara has been made, which I have shown in one of my books, you know, with the God like this, and you, whether he's seen like this. Shiva is in many different forms because in this historical process of Brahmanization taking place, the Brahmins or the people who were hegemonic, the people who had all the power moving into areas from Uttar Pradesh, from Bihar, coming right into Madhya Pradesh, coming into the interiors, encountering people who had different gods and goddesses, and then bringing them within their fold. Instead of discarding them, that's why we have such large numbers. Instead of discarding them entirely, instead of saying, no, your gods are not acceptable to us, accepting them and the raison the, the, the way or the mode, sorry, the modus operandi, the way they bring them into the fold, you will see through mythology. The mythographers, the people who are writing the myths, are constantly refurbishing the myths, are constantly writing them and rewriting them because Brahminical hegemony can be controlled only when everybody is believing in the same things. Everybody likes the same narratives. Everybody believes that everybody's gods are accommodated. I remember once Andhra Bethe said in one of his uh, lectures that I wish this had happened with the people as well. In India, the untouchables stayed untouchables, but we do call their gods because it's true. With Within Shivaism, you will find within Shivaism, you'll find that Shiva has such a big entourage. He has the Bhutas, he has the young Yoganis, he has the Yakshinis, he has every, you know, Skanda Kartike. All of them may have been, Ganesha, Ganesha may have been a very popular god somewhere in uh, Maharashtra to begin with. He brought them all within the, his umbrella as his family members, just like Vishnu did. Uh, with the with the avatars, you could say the Vishnu's popularity increased manifold each time somebody was pronounced as somebody meaning a god was pronounced as his avatar, and the same thing happened with, with Shiva. Shiva perhaps could not have survived all these centuries. Shiva perhaps could not have endured as a quality as an idea if he was not married, for instance. If he did not have children. If he did not have that kind of uh, lifestyle that he has. But what is interesting is. He doesn't just stay there. He is constantly facing a tussle a pravritti and nivritti that is a tussle of being engaged with the world and going away from the world, withdrawing from the world. So you constantly find him wanting to go into the jungles, go into the mountains and meditate and be away from the family life. And that's why my last book, I called it Shiva, the reluctant family man, because very often he's very reluctant. So that tussle that you find in many people's hearts and minds that they like to be away, they don't want to entirely leave the family life, yet they have to be part of the family life, is very much alive in Shiva. So I find that Shiva straddles many different ideas, many different cultural markers of India, many different, um, uh, you know, things that have, you know, things that have come, come to fruition, things that have been resolved. There's been a lot of cultic tension, but they are also resolved, whether it's Vishnu and from, and by the way, 
Vishnu and Shiva also uh, are shown in an Arthanarishwara form that is in the Harihar form. So half the body in one, one sculpture, half the body is Vishnu and half the body is Shiva. And, and in, when you look at the sectarian uh, Purans, like you look at the Vishnu Purans, then the right side, the right is always considered better. The right side is taken by Vishnu's form and the left side is taken by Shiva's form. And I would think that this kind of uh, Arthanarishwara, this kind of composite image, this kind of syncretism must have brought a whole lot of the worshippers together, both the Vishnu and Shiva. We do know we have evidence even to this day, especially in the south of Vaishnavs and Shaivites absolutely being at loggerheads with each other. So it would have been if you have one image and one God representing both of them, that is the Harihar Murti or the Harihar image, then the Harihar image then simultaneous worship has, has to be done by the worshippers of both Shiva and Vishnu. So I think this is just marvelous. It's like syncretism. It's like a thinking ahead that, okay, this problem is there. This is how we're going to solve it. So I have tremendous admiration for those who are writing out those myths, tremendous admiration for the sculptors who are making that wonderful art, and tremendous admiration for the believers and the people with devout faith who, who loved all this. It's like the, uh, sometimes this almost tomfoolery when you see the, uh, the gods and the way they fight with each other and the way they are silly and stupid almost sometimes with each other. I love the sense of humor that you see in the Purans. The Purans are texts which are meant for everybody. You know, they say the Vedas are meant for only the highly cerebral people. But the Purans are meant for everyone. So everyone can understand, you know, get to know about social no mores, you get to know about you get to know about uh, the customs, you get to know about how to worship a God, you get to know about the geography of a place, about different pilgrimage spots, you get to know about a lot of things in the Purans. And in the middle of that, you have these wonderful uh, myths. So um, I think I, I wanted to put forward this point mainly, that if we have such a large number of gods and goddesses, if we have such a large number of representations of Shiva, there is a historical reason behind that. And the reason being that all the gods and goddesses were brought within the fold of Brahminism. They were all given a place within Brahminism. They were not ex excluded. That's different if the people didn't like them. But the Brahmins, the people who were responsible for writing the Qurans, the large sections of people who were literate and who were in the position of authority to write the Qurans, saw to it that they all got accommodated, whether it was a connection and you know whether it was Skanda Kartikeya with his six heads, whether it was Ganesha with the elephant head in the body of a small child, everything is explained that why did it happen like this. And those people, therefore, sometimes it is sadly been said that that may have been the reason why people got pacified. Uh, people did not revolt against Brahminism and the caste system and untouchability but so much because their gods were accommodated by Brahminism. I don't know how far that is true. But I just want to put across to you that in the plethora of gods that exist within India, within Hinduism, Shiva is definitely a grand god who is definitely worth looking at and uh, definitely worth studying and talking about and even just finding him such an interesting person as a married person, as a married man, as a single man who's meditating, as a person who is involved in such cosmic you know, realities, uh, you know, the celestial world, what's happening there, how to take care of this, how to take care of that. And more, most relevant today for the time that we are in disease, one of his one of my favorite epithets for him, which is repeated again and again, is that Shiva is Vaityanatha. He is the one who will ultimately take us away from the misery, hopefully, and the disease that we all are seeing around us today. Thank you very much. So that was so wonderful and I should give you an applause right here from Kulu Valley. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I hope it was... Yeah, uh, go on. No, no, go on. I think I, I really welcome questions. I think some questions will come and we can further. I didn't want to go into too much detail to bore everyone. I just wanted to put one point, main points across. So I'm very happy to get questions now. Um, so Nali, can you remove the... Yeah, I, yeah. yeah that's better. Yeah. Uh, now others can put their uh, videos up. And I do want to yeah. say that uh, you just took me back to... Uh, my MA class reminded me <laughs> okay. of uh, yeah. I hope I hope there were some additions made, Sonali. That was a long time ago. <laughs> of course, of course they were, but you know, it, it was just that you know moment in time that I, it just okay. felt so good. That's what I want to tell you. It felt so good. And uh, thank you very much. And I do want to like in the group uh, today. I'm going to put uh, the names of all your books 
uh, you have written some and I didn't talk yes, about I have some of them here. I have some of them here. I would love to share this wonderful cover by a very famous Bengali artist. Uh, I have Nandlal Bose. So I have some of my books are here. Yes, but thank you very much. I, I should be Let me get the questions. It'll be very nice. Or the comments, even if they're not questions. It'll be very I, nice. I did notice that a few on the chat, they had been asking questions. So why don't we at this point in time, uh, uh, each one of you can raise your hands and then we can take each question one by one. And whoever has a question, please introduce yourselves uh, and your interest in Shiva and the Himalayas. Uh, so... Um, let me try scrolling up. Can we have the first question, please? I know that uh, uh, Dr. S. Kumar uh, had asked, uh, uh, so I'm just taking a random question. Uh, he had asked, uh, what is uh, Shiva's relationship to transvestites? So if you could answer that question. Uh, no, it, uh, yes, I can. I mean, uh, the relation is that they do worship the Ardhanarishwara. And uh, this is the only God who is uh, shown as half male and half female. And psychologically, it's very comforting to know that, you know, you can, uh, but one way of looking at Arthanarishwara is that, you know, we all have the male and female brains. We know that. And we male and female sides to us. But here, the, the, the transfer sites specifically find a God who is half male and half female. So they definitely identify with, with him and worship him. Okay. Uh... Okay. The next question uh, is uh, Anushka. Anushka has her um, hand up. Uh, they're not going to ask. They don't want to ask themselves. Uh, no, they, they didn't ask. ask so because earlier okay. nobody had put their hands up. So now I'm seeing a hand up. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anushka, if you could unmute yourself and ask the same, uh, the next question, and if you could introduce yourself before you do that. Oh, oh. Good evening, ma'am. I am Anushka's father, Manoj Kumar, working as curator, archaeological museum, Gurukul Kangri University. Okay. Hello. Yeah. And uh, first of all, I must congratulate you to provide us uh, very good uh, evidence, uh, organic evidence uh, for the origin of our Dhanarishwar images of uh, uh, Lord Shiva. And uh, I am working on uh, the goddess Lalita. And uh, can you throw some light uh, on the goddess Lalita with reference to Lord Shiva, please? No, yes. I'm not listening. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, I can hear you. Okay, so it's uh, it's like this. Uh, I have read the Lalita Sahasranama, and uh, it is basically Parvati. Uh, you, it is Parvati. It is uh, the wife, the spouse of uh, of Shiva, who is also involved in um, uh, de defeating a demon. And uh, that's what Lalita's main in the Lalita Sahasranama. That's what it's talking about. It's, but it's very much rooted in South India. So uh, I, I don't remember very too many details, but I have mentioned uh, Lalita Sesanama in some of my writings. Uh, she is definitely considered the wife of Shiva. Uh, there are different uh, goddesses like Minakshi down south in Tamil Nadu. She's also considered the wife of Shiva. And uh, Shiva has various names like in, uh, in uh, Maharashtra, he's called Khandoba. If you go, there's a god called Khandoba, Melhara there in, uh, in Andhra Pradesh. These are all local names, but they, they are, when you ask them who is this, they will even the worshippers will say this is another rupe or this is another manifestation of Shiva himself. Similarly, Lalita is Parvati. Lalita is Durga, but she's uh, involved in defeating a particular demon. But she has the same in her thousand names in the Sahasranama. She has all the epithets of Parvati. Is that okay? Um, yes. Yeah. So ma'am, I want. I want. To elaborate something, I can say Bolunga Jabata. Yes, please go on. Yeah, we can. Yeah, hear. yeah, ma'am, please. Yeah. Um, Haridwar is very interesting in this regard, madam. I want to add some more information about this goddess. Yes, we please. have a river called Lalita Rao. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. We have in Haridwar, on the left of Haridwar, when we move uh, from Delhi to uh, um, the Badrinath Highway. On yes. the left side near Harki Paddy, yeah. uh, there is a there is a seasonal torrent that is called Lalita Rao. Okay. And uh, it is a very ancient name. And yes. uh, we have uh, in our museum from Haridwar, 
there is an image of tapsha parvat yes where five five uh, uh, fire altars have been shown okay. so all these uh, narration you have already narrated i don't want to repeat it but okay. uh, uh, could you please throw more light on the particular puranic evidence which you are citing for the origin that shiva should include lalita or parvati in his body so uh, yes i think we Yes, I think can we uh, can I answer this separately later, Sonali? Uh, the more details because he wants the reference. So the exact reference. It's uh, I, I'm I'm trying to remember. Is it the Matsya Markandeya Puran? If I'm not mistaken, the Lalita. Markandeya Puran. Yeah, I, I, but I will definitely get back to him with the exact uh, ones. Yes, yeah, I'll send you the more. email and maybe you can interact. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, so we can have some more questions from other people if, or or just comments. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the next ma'am this is deep though uh, hi deep hi shall i go ahead or is there anyone yes. in the queue uh actually deep though if you could just wait because i'm taking uh, the ones who have their hands raised first so i think you would come after dr s kumar would that be okay sure let me know once i i yeah. ask them. Okay. yes i will yeah yes uh uh you have just kindly answered something about the transfer uh, that uh, relation relationship with these transfers but you know recently i mean there was a lot of importance given when there was this uh, kumbh mela that there was a special uh, you know uh, uh, this given to these people now i want to know i mean like was there anything uh, you know special or is there a special mention that he brought them under the wing or gave them some kind of a you know status in society at any time do you have mention of that any time um that's a very interesting question but i i think maybe sociologists would be knowing this in my historical texts in the purans i have not come across uh, we know that the kinnars are, are part of kinnars are kinnars. Part of, yeah the yes, kinnars yes. are part of, they, are, they are part of his entourage you see uh, right. shiva's entourage will have people i don't want to use the word it's politically incorrect but they have actually translated as misshapen people people with just one eye people like what the the whole idea that is communicated about shiva is that he has all the marginalized sections of society following him including untouchables the chandalas the nishadas everyone is following him and he does not make any demarcation between them in fact in his movies you'll find that he holds a bell like an untouchable a chandala is supposed to do hold the bell and ring the bell before you enter the village so that the brahmins will get to know so i would think that yes marginalized sections have always been favored by shiva in the text but specifically i don't have a reference uh, to this yeah all right thank you thank you so much uh thank you dr kumar we have harshada uh, uh, with the next question and uh, deepto i will take you after harshada so harshada if you could introduce yourself uh can you hear me Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, hello, ma'am. I'm Harshita Virkud. Uh, I'm currently a research scholar. I'm doing my PhD from Deccan College on Askers. Okay. And I'm also working as a, a museums coordinator with the uh, Maharashtra State. Okay. Uh, ma'am, my question is: You said Rudra is the only god who is associated with diseases in Rig Veda. right uh, are there any goddesses that come uh, in that and how does it change from a male god associated with diseases and then changes to uh, you know females mostly being associated with uh, diseases yes Disease yes goddesses Can yes you uh, thank you i get, well, I, well i definitely i don't know if he's the only god but he is the god okay. who is called he is the god who's called physician of all physicians and he is constantly told that he knows about the medicines he knows about the herbs he knows what to give to people when they get afflicted with disease that's been mentioned in the rigveda and various hymns where the where the female goddesses are concerned i have no doubt that they are in the population among the very population of india people who have been worshiping the goddesses to cure them of diseases and shitala mata must be having a very old antiquity she must be going back into the past uh, everything that's not registered in the sanskrit puranic text uh, doesn't mean if, if it's not registered there it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist so we know that they play, play that's what i was trying to say that they do play a hegemonic role but it doesn't mean that it didn't exist among the people so shitala mata and other matas like that who are mata meaning also like mata means mother but mata also when people say mata i hai they mean pestilence they mean you know chicken pox measles any of those things that would be 
there. So yes, I think the goddesses must have been uh, prevalent all along, al al along with Shiva being called, uh, Rudra being called uh, the Vedyanath. Yes, all along. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Harshada. Uh, we will next take Deepto. Uh, Deepto, if you're ready with your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you, ma'am, for the lecture. I mean, it was quite enlightening. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, I mean, see, the thing is, my question is very basic because I'm not a scholar on this, but I, I have a little bit of interest and I just keep on reading from here and there. Uh, yeah. So, uh, what I was actually thinking is uh, uh, the worship of Shakti is uh, quite prevalent in the region of Eastern India. In the region of? In the Eastern India. The Eastern yes, India. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, I, I just want to know, I mean, uh, the female goddess, the female goddesses of uh, Hinduism, are they all part of Shakti or there are other type of goddesses as well? And how is, I mean, uh, what I know, I'm not very sure that Shakti is probably a kind of, uh, I mean, some manifestation of Shiva, I'm not very sure. I mean, you may probably a little bit enlighten on that. And But still, I would like to know, I mean, how is uh, Shiva associated with that? But I know Parvati and Durga, Mahakali, Shinnamasta, yes. all are part of Shakti. So this yes. is what I wanted yeah. to do. Yes. Uh, so Deepto, uh, definitely these Eastern goddesses that you're talking about, they're all, and Shakti is such an important aspect of Hinduism, especially Tantrism, especially Shaktism. That whole area, you know, the Eastern part of the, of the country is definitely imbued with all these goddesses. Yeah. But I would say that not all goddesses. No, I don't look at Lakshmi representing Shakti. I mean, you can extend it and say she has a certain kind of Shakti. Maybe yes. But, um, and you can say that maybe for Saraswati also. But basically the concept of Shakti as being an energy, the life-giving energy, the, the, the force, the creative right. force, and mm -hmm. that power, that belongs to Durga. And all her manifestations of Kali, Durga, you know, Parvati, that belongs to her. And Shakti and Shiva, that famous saying that's there, that without Shakti, Shiva becomes a Shava. He's a corpse. I so they like, we like to see the two of them in tandem with each other. As Purusha Prakriti, Shiva Shakti, knowledge, Ling the Yoni, the Ling is in the Yoni. So if, if the whole creation of this world cannot take place without the two of them. So that is the connection Shiva has. And that is an egalitarian, very open, very equal relationship between the male principle and the female principle. Cool. And one just quick question. I mean, it's not, not very elaborate. I just, it just came to my mind is yeah. uh, regarding the practices of Hinduism. So there are... Uh, Two practices. One is a kind of Vaishnav practice. One is a Tantric practice. Kind of yes, two things. Yes. So mostly the Vaishnav practice happen, happens in all the households everywhere. How yes. is the, what I have heard? So I have actually been to. Uh, I mean, I had uh, the chance of uh, communicating with Arban Tantric, who stays in the cities and do yeah. yoga and all. Where yeah. in the yogas you provide all the your you cut your hand, provide the blood when you do Chinnamastha puja and all. So yes. I just want to know. I mean, in these days and all, how is what I understand the tantric rituals and all are very prevalent in the it's a very integral part of Hinduism right or, yes but how is it yes. seen now? no it's very integral but nobody will confess that they are a tantric so it'll always be uh, shrouded in mystery we really don't get to know I, I yet have to meet a person who will openly say yes I do tantric puja and I am a tantric and, and it's sad that it has got such it's been looked upon so disparagingly because there are certain good points about tantrism but I also feel that tantrism and Hinduism are also intertwined with each other so it's difficult to demarcate the two of them so sometimes people say oh tantrism is those extreme practices and they, they're not part of Hinduism but they were all part of Hinduism to begin with this whole idea of puja smearing of the tikka and the blood is tantric it wasn't there to begin with in Hinduism right. it became later so there is a very strong connection but I, I don't know more I mean because I, I don't really know about people who follow tantrism got it, got it. thank you ma'am thank you thank you Deepto thank you so um, we have uh, Dr. Parth here who has a question and then after that I'll take Ritu and Tanashri ready. Uh, so um, here is uh, Parth. Hello Parth. I, I really enjoyed your Hi. Um, Pardon? My question is about Shiva's personality. It's a two part yes. question. So one is, uh, is uh, his personality viewed differently across India? Uh, yes. And how does his personality historically evolve? in religious literature over time? 
Yes, okay. So yes, definitely his personality is viewed differently. When you look at him in Bengal, for instance, in Calcutta, because they're mainly Durga worshippers, uh, they condemn Shiva that he's just lying around, not going into the fields, not doing his work, not earning any money. And the poor daughter, and they look at her as the daughter-in-law and the daughter, the poor daughter, she just has to suffer so much. And she looks forward, therefore, every time during Durga Puja to come to her parents' home because her, her husband is uh, good for nothing. So Shiva is not looked upon as being very, I mean, in the East I've seen because it's mainly goddess worship. He has a different persona among the folk people, among local people. And uh, I would say that in the South, he has a different, in the South, I find that he's often shown with beautiful crowds and he's Sundareshwar, he's beautifully dressed. And he, that uh, whole idea of him being the way ash is smeared with snakes, etc. that's more in the North, I find. I find in the South, I mean, I, I'm speaking very broadly and yes, I am generalizing. I find that he has a different persona in different parts of India. It could be said, broadly speaking, that he does have. And what was the second part of your question? Uh, uh, how is it written in, in literature? Is that right? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Sonali? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. You're muted, you Sonali. Mute us because I forgot to unmute us. Ah, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. No, so that's what I feel. I hope that answered your one part of your question. And religious literature talks about it. Every place that you have Sthal Purans, you have Purans belonging to certain specific regions. So they talk about the different different shivas that exist there. You know, there's a pair of the, the uh, you know, you hear about Vaishnu Devi. He, she ran away. She was the Kumari. She was the virgin goddess. She ran away from Bhairav. She did not like Shiva. So they have a completely in the mountains. And Sonali, you would know that they have a different way of viewing Shiva in that particular area of Vaishnav Devi. So yes, there are different uh, ways. And that shows the multitudinous ideas that exist in India. And yet everybody will, they don't f war with each other over it. You know, they're, they're fine with their representation of Shiva. Okay, thank you. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. And uh, just to that, you know, I wanted to share something and I'll take Dr. Smitha Segal after this. But I want uh, yes, to share yes. I wanted to share something like here in Kulu Valley, we have this temple and you know, this whole thing about uh, sectarian conflict that you see yes. in myths and all. Yes. We also see it in, um, uh, you know, temple architecture here. Uh, there is yeah. a beautiful temple in Nagar, it's the Krishna temple. And uh, it was actually camouflaging uh, an earlier Shiva temple. And yes, yes, uh, yes. when I went around there and there were some amorous scenes which are always associated with Shiva temples. Yes. And when I yeah. pointed that out to one of the family members of the priest, he, he said, no, uh, I said, this is a Shiva temple. He said, no, it's Krishna. I said, no, it was Shiva's temple. And he got very upset with me. And I showed him, yes. I pointed out the amorous scenes. I said, this is associated yeah. with Shiva. Yes. And he yeah. just made the scene unseen. So for me, that is very yes. important. That what is not yes. said, but what exists and how is that That's translated. Right. And how the Absolutely. whole area believes in uh, what is, even though evidence is there, but they still kind of, you know, hide it. Yes, when absolutely, you absolutely. Away from that core area, those things are yes. uh, in the memory of the people. So memory plays such an important role of these yes. myths and these stories and what is and yes. what isn't. So it's yes, pretty absolutely. fascinating here. You see that happening here as well. That's right, that's right, that's right, yeah. So, yeah. Now I'll take uh, 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 Dr. Smita uh, Segal, and then I'll take Ritu, and then Tanashri, and then Anand Anandita. So, uh, okay. Dr. Smita Segal, uh, your question, please. Sorry. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you again, Nilima. Always a pleasure. Smita, so nice to see you. <laughs> Very nice to see you. <laughs> I am, I am uh, Smita Segal from uh, Lady Sri Ram College. Uh, I've had a pleasure of knowing Nilima for good 30 years now, more yes, than that. Yes. Every yes. time I hear what she has to say, something new comes up. So Nilima, oh. there's a question for you here, and this is purely from a historical point of view. Do okay. we get any corresponding evidence in epigraphic, numismatic, or literary sources that would reiterate that subtle tension amongst the followers of Shiva and Parvati? Because what you're telling us right now is purely from the mythological point of view. Yes. So if we were to get it from some other point of view, from some other source, 
whether it's going to yes. resonate and definitely at the moment I yes. think it was a hypothesis. Yes. Oh uh, yes, I just at the outset want to say historians are never happy with just one source. They always want corroborative evidence. <laughs> so with the media, I have to be careful. We need to have corroborative evidence. Well, you know, it is subtle. It is not, since I did after, when I was also studying Madhya Pradesh and looking at the, you know, tension, because I found it in sculptures. So I found that um, sculptures, you can see it, you know, you can see them playing Chaucer. You can see Shiva completely in a skeletal form while playing Chaucer. There is a wonderful image of Shiva in Madhya Pradesh where he is playing Chaucer. She's full body, nicely draped, and he's there skeleton, showing that, you know, he's emaciated by her, okay? But anyway, that is just one interpretation. So I didn't find in epigraphy this kind of, you know, maybe it's, you know, the, it's a very form of epigraphy. No? Smithai, they don't write in detail. They're not narratives, you know? They, mm -hmm. they will probably, no, so they don't do that. So I have not actually found it, but I, there are references to the myths. There are just references to the myths without going into too much detail. They'll say, oh, when Shiva put Ganga onto his head. Oh, when, and that's another thing that I, I find very interesting that Ganga in the South is considered a wife of Shiva. And uh, it, it is very uh, nice that there is one very beautiful myth in which it is said that Shiva, Parvati wanted to become half of Shiva because she was very suspicious of Ganga sitting on the head of Shiva and she did not <laughs> like it. And she constantly fought with him that you put her on your head and from your head she's going to go into your ear and she's going to enter your body. So, you know, this kind of language is used in, the, in, in Tamil Nadu in one of the folklore things. So, it's like a tension between Ganga, a tension between Parvati, a tension between Shiva. But I think just the format because epigraphs okay. being the way they are. And you know, epigraphs, uh, Smitha, you know, it's all about land grants and what land is being given. The religious part is very often, at least the ones that I study from 5th century to 12th century, the religious part is fairly less compared to the rest of the part of its institution. Thank so you. nice of you to attend my lecture. She's yes. such a great scholar herself. She is a wonderful scholar. Thank you, Smitha. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saigal, for that question. And uh, let's go over to Ritu for her question. Yeah. Hi, Nilima. First of all, compliments for the great energy that you have while narrating. Uh, you're so expressive and a lot of new things came up because I'm a novice uh, here. But it's great listening to you. Uh, my question may be a little uh, different from here, but although connected. So we say that Brahma, Vishnu, Mahesh. So creator, preserver and destroyer. So uh, my question, which is pondering, uh, you know, since long, especially this COVID time, is why is it whenever there is a disaster or somebody falls ill, we do Mahamritunje and we worship Lord Shiva instead of the preserver, Lord Vishnu? Yeah. So uh, I just love your question because I have been writing about this for some time and talking about it that I don't think that Shiva is the destroyer. And I do want to, uh, you know, say this again and again, because in the midst, the role that he has played so often is that of a savior. And if you just go into the Samudra Manthan myth, the myth in which the ocean is churned mm. again, when there's apocalypse and everything goes underneath the ocean and the ocean is being churned. And when the black smoke, horrible polluted smoke come, starts coming out of the ocean with all that churning, Nobody can save it. Vishnu cannot save the world. He's supposed to be the preserver. He can't preserve the world. Brahma can't save it. All the gods go stampering to Shiva who's sitting somewhere separately in the Mount Kailash and doing his meditation. And it's only when Shiva comes and swallows it and thereby becomes mm. ilkant. Only then is the world saved. So again and again in the midst, this is, this is just one instance that I find that Shiva is actually preserving the earth and he's a savior of the earth. And, save it. and so when I asked pundits and I asked other people, because now I like to do that. Why do you call him the destroyer? They, they like to say that he destroys the past. He destroys ugliness in us. He destroys, you know, then it becomes like metaphysical kind of thing. He destroys uh, everything that is hurtful in our life. That's what he does. But the Mahamrityunjaya Bra, the uh, Mahamrityunjaya Mantra is there in the earliest text in the Rig Veda. It is there in the Rig Veda, it is there in the Yajur Veda, it is very interesting to me that already he is being associated with something so important in our lives, that is death. He is Mahakal, he is associated with time, he is associated with death, not looking at it as something terrible, but looking at it as something that is part of life. So I don't think he, dis he doesn't destroy, he's, looking, he's more into regeneration. I mean, look at the Ling. The Ling is all about regeneration. The Ling is about created, creation and reproduction. So either you can say that, or you can say the second thing that I said, 
Shiva is an antinomian god. He has, he has the polar opposites existing within his very own being. So yes, he can destroy. You can look at it that way. I've given you three ways how you can look at it. He does destroy, but he also is involved in regeneration. So believe me, he does. he's not just the destroyer. Like I said in the midst, he's also the preserver. He's also the savior. And he also is the one who will give you, through the Mrityunjaya, reciting the Mrityunjaya Mantra, will give you an easy passage once you die, and e an easier death. That is what is believed by people today. That is how they use that Rig Veda Mantra, mm -hmm. which is so powerful to chant. I don't know so if I was able Pro Your probably question. this word destroyed is taken in the other sense. Oh, mm -hmm. you were able, you were actually yes. able to. Yeah. Yes, in, a, in another, in the sense of this, like Kal, Kal also means time. It also means okay. black and color, but it also means time. So he's Mahakaleshwar, the time that has been gone, has gone by, it's, he's destroyed that time. Now you're coming to a new time. So it's also a psychological way of thinking, not going on and on about the past, but that's Carl, that's gone. You know, he's also the giver of time, he's also the keeper of time. So there are many bit different ways you can interpret this. Great, great. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for that Sonali? question. Um, we'll take uh, Anandita Ghosh as the next uh, person. Um, and uh, Kanashri had to leave because she had to uh, attend to something urgent. So she's apologized and she said she will uh, connect with you later. So let's take Anandita and then we'll take Deepshika and then we have Heyman Singh Bisht. I hope you're okay, okay with all the questions. You're not in a hurry. No, no, I'm fine. That, I, I, that's Sonali, that's why I gave more time i thought many many points of the lecture will come through the queries that's why i said let me speak for about 35 minutes and then we can have to go no problem okay. yes yeah questions hello ma'am thank you for a beautiful narration on shiva uh, i'm a research scholar from iit mandi and i'm working on uh, middle class uh, of india during uh, arkanarayan times so i'm working on arkanarayan novels um, okay so uh, I just wanted your point or perspective on how Shiva is related to uh, transgender. Yes. Can you throw some light on it? Uh, okay. Uh, I, this question was asked earlier. Did you hear it? Uh, I don't know if you heard it. Uh, I talk, the transgender, the transvestites. Did you hear me uh, talk about? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. But I uh, just wanted to know he uh, how come he is associated to transgenders means as in uh, um, in the worshipping kind of thing is he worshipped or uh, just a history related to it about no, how I, ayappa was born uh, yes uh, see so uh, there are many now you brought in another sphere about ayappa that's the coming together of vishnu and shiva so that is looked upon with some amount of happiness by the gay community as well because it's the two males getting together and giving birth to ayappa but that's another i mean that that's why I've had to limit myself, which is so vast, actually, this whole area. But I do think that uh, without having any evidence in the text, I do think that the whole idea of Ardhanarishwara is appealing as a bisexual uh, to the bisexual community as well as to the transvestites. I do think that it's appealing just because it is half male and half female. I don't actually have evidence. Sociologists would have studied this. But whatever I have researched, whatever I have been able to research, they definitely look at Shiva as their chosen god. If you look at the Brahminical pantheon, Shiva is more their god than Vishnu, Krishna, or any of them will be. Why Shiva did this? Uh, like I said, said in the beginning, it could have even been because of the coming together in one form of two different divinities. To increase the, 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 the popularity of a god like Shiva, that could have been one of the reasons. And the second reason is Shiva always encompasses and brings within his umbrella the marginalized. I have no doubt that the transvestites would have been marginalized in ancient times, just like they are even now. So Shiva is the god who gives space to everybody, regardless of color, creed, uh, you know, body shape, whatever. He was, he's a very, he used to be a very open god. That's how he is perceived. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anandita. Uh, we have uh, Deep Shikha as the next uh, person who needs to ask you a question. Okay. Is she there? She's not there, I think. 
Yeah, now I'm unmuted. Oh, hi. hello. Okay, hi. Hi. Yeah. I mean, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was really amazing. I actually I I have a kind of an awkward question, but it's a long-standing question that I never got the proper answer to. Deep uh, so before you ask, ask, sorry, before you ask, could you tell us a little bit about? Yeah, your, uh, I was going to go there. Yeah, so I'm an I'm an archaeologist. I studied from uh, Deccan College also, and uh, now I'm right now I'm doing my PhD in conservation science. But uh, this question is uh, from my master's time because uh, we had a field trip to uh, Bhubaneswar yeah. with my classmates. And I was with uh, our teacher who taught us religious history and also uh, yeah. this, uh, uh, these temples in Bhubaneswar, they, they do have a lot of erotic uh, sculptures yes, and yes, yes. almost all of these temples uh, are uh, of uh, Shiva. Yeah, and we have a lot of these erotic sculptures. So I asked my teacher, like, what What do you think is the rationale behind this uh, uh, this depiction only in uh, Shiva temples? And yeah. he told me it means uh, it is the idea behind that is that uh, the, he says like Bahar uh, Kam Mandir Ram. So he says that you have to leave all your desires outside the temple. That's why they built all these uh, sculptures outside the temple. And when you go inside, you have to be behind all your uh, these kind of uh, desires of uh, calm. And then you go and pray. So I mean, I was not completely convinced by that. But if you have uh, another theory yes. about Yes, uh, Dinshika, there are many, many reasons given for the te temples having this. I mean, there are many. I'll just mention a few of them. Uh, this is the, this is what everyone says about, you know, that this is their understanding about most people. But there also was uh, this understanding of, you know, having outside the temples a lot that shows the fecundity, the fertility of life, the flourishing of life, and um, sexual, the couples, uh, it, it was not considered wrong. Like, even if you go to Sanchi, you go to Bharut, which is like second century BC, you find already in, in Buddhist shrines, Buddhist uh, stupas, you find already completely nude females, the Shala Panjikas yeah. who are holding on to the, their, their nudity is complete, frontal nudity is completely shown. It's not considered wrong. So I don't think it's only in Shaiva temples. I see it in Khajurao and many other temples also. The other temples that are there, you find that there are, uh, there is, there was a particular period, a time when uh, it was considered the right thing to do to have it on the out exteriors of the temple as life. I mean, some historians have said they are supposed to be shown right at the bottom. Then you go a little higher. As you get higher and higher, your mind gets clearer and clearer. I mean, there are so many different ways that archaeologists and uh, sculpt, you know, art historians have looked upon it. But I do not think that nudity and I do not think that sexuality was considered wrong for the longest time in the in the India, in India, in the Indian subcontinent, a lot of the prudery that is associated with it now has a lot to do with the Victorian age and us being ruled by the Europeans. So I think nudity, I mean, you can see it, whether it's the gens, the, the, the uh, you know, the Dikambars, you can see that the nudity, you can see it in the Shiva, uh, you know, the, the all the Munis, all the, I mean, all the Nag Babas that are there in the Himalayas, yes. nudity. So I, there's, there's not this, um, we are not, uh, we are not uncomfortable with these things. And, and in the past, we definitely were not. So what, the mm -hmm. things that trouble me a little bit, I mean, I don't mind the sexual things that are shown, but when they go, get down to showing bestiality, like they yeah, show, they uh, they, yeah, so that makes me a little uncomfortable, but it was just a, a way of showing that this is life. This is what life is all about. There are different things, like you'll see kings and queens, you'll see a woman putting kajal in her eyes, you'll see a woman playing with a ball. So there are all these activities. These are all the activities that they are showing. That's how I look at it. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deep Shikha. And I have been getting a lot of private questions on one topic. Uh, yes. And I do have to say that um, uh, Dr. Anjali Kapila has, um, uh, she'll be giving a lecture on the songs of the Ganga. And she also has asked okay. this question. And I'll kind of, uh, put, I'll, I'll allow her to ask that question. But before I do that, um, when I circumambulate uh, the temple, the Shiva temple here, you know, I would always go uh, in a clockwise direction. And then I was told yes. by the yeah. harpers of the village that you go anti-clockwise yeah. and you do not okay. cross the makarmuk, the place okay. where the okay. uh, water comes okay. out. And I said, why? They said, because yeah. Ganga is on his locks. And if you do okay. this, this is, uh, you're uh, crossing the boundary. You cannot do that. So you have to go okay. anti-clockwise in a Shiva temple. I never knew yes. this. 
and yes, even I did not this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, I did not this. Uh, Heyman Singh Bisht has also asked this question, the historical point of view behind the mythology of Ganga. And if uh, Anjali ma'am could also ask her question relating to Ganga and we can just have you speak about Ganga because that's on everybody. <laughs> the Ganga is clean right now and you could yes. shed light on her background also. <laughs> well, we all know about the sages who worship, who, who did so much of asceticism for Ganga to be brought down to the earth. But we also know that she, in the Purans, we are told the myths in which she is, uh, she's almost stubborn. She's a goddess uh, as a celestial river, loving to be in the heavens and not wanting to descend to the earth at all. But because of all the tapasya, you see all the tapasya that has been done. And it, sometimes they say it was Arjun's parents. You know, there's that beautiful sculpture, you know, the relief in Mahabalipuram. And uh, you see them coming up, emerging of the Ganga. So, and in many sculptures, you find that, you know, Shiva is, the Ganga has been put on top of Shiva. There's a painting right in front of me in which Shiva, Ganga is collapsing on Shiva. So the idea is this, that, um, uh, and I want to say it here right now, that uh, in local lore, it's also said that Haridwar and Haridwar, how you pronounce it, do you know this? How you pronounce it shows whether you're a Vaishnavite or you're a Shavite. If you say Haridwar, Har is Shiva. Okay, he removes the remover Har. And Hari is, of course, Vishnu. So you show your preference. Secondly, uh, it is said by Vaishnavites that, oh, Ganga, Ganga is just a, go a river goddess. Shiva puts her, he has so much of respect for her. He puts her on his head. But look at Vishnu. She flows through his toes. He flows, she flo he flows, Ganga flows through the toes of Vishnu. So there's also a hierarchy and the rivalry and rivalry and, you know, like a kind of, kind of thing coming between the Vaishnavites and Shavites vis-a-vis -vis Ganga. But um, I would say that uh, uh, Ganga is personified as a woman even more when you go down south. And she's looked upon, it, it's, it, it seems like they're more comfortable with co-wives. And so she's looked upon, like I don't see this tradition in the north, but I see it in the south, that uh, Ganga is looked as, upon as a co-wife of Parvati. And that there are a lot of problems with that then, because Shiva has put her on the head. But besides the sculptural uh, antiquities that I've seen of Ganga coming from, uh, whether it is in, uh, you know, whether it is in Mahabalipuram or whether it is in different parts of the, you know, Madhya Pradesh, I don't know uh, that much, that many Puranic details on, on Ganga. I have not uh, done it, but it's interesting and I definitely will do it next time, you know, look for some Puranic details. I don't, I haven't found in the Purans that I've studied so far. Maybe someone on this panel, you know, maybe somebody knows a little bit more about Puranic details about uh, Ganga. I just know this one myth that I told you about, that uh, she descended because of the penance of the sages who wanted the Ganga to come and wash away the sins of the family of the sages. And uh, it's it's Priku, is it Priku? I think it's Sage Priku, if I'm not mistaken. Or is it Agastya? Sonali, do you remember? I don't remember. So it's one of them, and they're, uh, they're the ones who do that penance and they bring they have it come down. And uh, she is definitely considered a great river. But uh, having said that, she's mentioned only once in the Rig uh, It's mainly Saraswati, which is a very important river. Ganga is not important. Obviously, when they came, when the people descended down into the plains and came across Ganga, they saw the mighty of Ganga and started, you know, finding it worshipful. I don't know more about it than that. Thank you for that. We have two more questions. Uh -huh. We have Dr. Okay. Dr. Kumar who's raised her hand. So Dr. Kumar, if you could put your video on and ask your question. And I think last time uh, uh, we kind of skipped that part where we wanted to know about you as well. So if you could yeah. do that, that would be wonderful. Okay, I'm basically a person from tourism. I've done my doctorate in tourism, but I'm very, very much interested in Hindu, uh, this thing, and I follow it regularly. Okay. And I've also sort of had this thing, uh, you know, always wanted to know more and more about Shiva and visited all the temples. I've done the his 12 temples, except one, which I will do, you know, if I can. So uh, what I was saying about this, um, you know, there's that myth, you know, when the, about Ganga, just sharing with you since you said this, that, um, you know, like the Ganga, uh, you know, that, that's um, uh, some, uh, the son of some uh, guru, yes, he yes. killed about 100 uh, people. Yes. And then, you know, like they said that, all right, if Ganga comes and blesses them, they'll all become alive. Yes. And yeah. so with a lot of this thing, you know, then Ganga finally agreed. But, you know, her, um, you know, the, uh, her, uh, that, um, 
she was so strong yeah. and then they said that if she comes to the earth then she'll destroy everything she'll destroy it, so yeah. i think shiva uh, yeah so yes. shiva offered offered that you know you can come through my hair and so he really became the controlling factor you know for river ganga and that's why you know in a way it gets controlled through his hair i mean that's what i i mean whatever you know it's I, yeah, but can, I say, can i say something yeah. here please so i'm really i'm so glad that you reminded me of that because uh, vandana shiva has written about it so environmentalists love this myth this particular myth because they said shiva's jatas represent the forest yes. and if you chop yeah. off the forest then the, the current of the river will destroy like it happened some right. years ago Yes. So you have yes. to keep the forest and look at Shiva. He said that if I put her here on top of my head, she and I have seen that she was willful and capricious and angry. She said, I don't want to descend to the earth. I have seen that myth. Yes. And so she said, I will come with such a lot of force that I will destroy the earth. Okay. She said, I don't right. want to come. So he then, that's when he is again, and I, this ties back with what I said, he being the savior. He said, I will save the earth. I will let, put her on top of my head. She will come through my tresses. I have such thick tresses. And by the time it came down to the earth, it was so gently. So the Ganga right. came gently that's because of Shiva. So I'm so right. glad you reminded me of that. I just forgot that. But environmentalists yes. love this myth, especially Mantana Shiva. Yes. Right, right. Go ahead. Go one ahead. more thing, one yes. one thing, uh, you know, like there is a uh, there's some mention about Shiva's daughters. He yes. has one daughter, two sons, and one daughter. And then yes. one daughter somewhere, you know, she keeps coming up in the towards the east that he had and who he ignored, and she always wanted to be accepted by him as his daughter or something. I don't okay. know if you are. Uh, is there any mention about this or? In your I, study, if you have found it, no, I haven't actually. But that's very interesting. I've just heard about Narmada that Narmada could be a daughter of Shiva, the river Narmada. I've read that in one place, but I've not read okay. otherwise. And I've read also about uh, some somebody said about Santoshima, but then Santoshima, they've also said no, she was the daughter of uh, of uh, Ganesha, not of Shiva. So there must be different uh, myths and different legends in different parts of India. So uh, it's very likely that some people believe that he had a daughter. I don't know about that. Okay, somebody called Ashok something, you know, Ashok. her name comes out okay. of that. Maybe you could, you know, yes, in your interest if sometimes. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. yes thank, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Uh, we'll take um, Anushka Singh uh, and then Ritu after that with the next question. No, I'm Anush Kumar, uh, father of Anushka Singh. My okay. Please. Are so, you listening? Sorry about that. Sorry you, about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, since uh, I have been working in Haridwar for the last 17 years, so um, I must say something about uh, the Puranic reference uh, of uh, River Ganga. Okay. And uh, I have excavated a site near Rishikesh that okay. is called uh, Shampur Gadi. It is uh, actually Brahma worth of Skand Puran. Professor okay. Hans Baker also once visited and okay. with him we have explored all those area and uh, I am just uh, narrating these things since uh, I have been, uh, uh, I am compelled to uh, narrate all these things because it is associated with the river Ganga. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you, if, you, if you have been to the Vadrinath, uh, there is a place uh, between Srinagar and Rishikesh that is called Byasi. Okay. Uh, and Biasi, Biasi from Ganga is uh, becoming a little wider. And uh, up to Rishikesh, it is. And from Rishikesh okay. to uh, Bhadreshwar, that is uh, uh, near IDPL factory, near Ems Rishikesh, a site uh, uh, which was excavated by Dr. N. C. Ghosh of the Archaeological Survey of India, where the Kushana Shiv temple was. On Earth, okay. just four, okay. four decades back. Okay. Yeah, and uh, that is Bhadreshwar. Yeah. So I want to just uh, narrate because there is a very very uh, long story of uh, the destruction of uh, uh, Dutch sacrifice when Shiva was not invited. Yes, yes. So yes. Uh, uh, there is a story that two people were associated. Yeah. 
two people was associated one is som sharma and the other is rabhya rishi okay rabhya uh, uh, literally means those who perform purusharth okay so on the uh, when, when 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 lord shiva was and even lord vishnu was very uh, happy after uh, their penance they wanted to uh, just uh, give a glimpse of uh, him at the site of uh, rishikesh near bharat mandir and bharat mandir is a place where you can still find the kushana images okay and uh, dr k p notial of uh, gadwal university now he is no more he excavated nicely that site okay and i have been to that place and skand puran also mentioned because there is a kedar khand and the geographical limitation of that kedar yes. and has been yes. fully described yes, yes. Yeah. and uh, vishnu in the form of a kubjamrak Yeah. that is a bent uh, kind of a mango tree uh, yeah. they have just uh, given a glimpse to uh, som sharma and uh, the rishi rab at that point okay and okay. this is the only reference but okay. possibly where lord shiva and vishnu are found combined together so uh, we are talking about the hari hari image this is the possible archaeological and literary narration of okay. this fact only and okay. from th from this place if you go towards hari dwar there is a place i have already narrated that is virbhadra that is bhadreshwar shiva yeah, and where where the water is very mighty even the gravity should be very noble and auspicious that's why this is virbhadra Okay. and from virbhadra down to uh, haridwar there is a place called haripur where the saptarishi is there even in okay. rishikesh also there is a saptarishi but in yeah. haridwar it is very well defined and uh, there is a narration in skand puran when uh, shiva was not invited and when the daksha has uh, just installed a linga of him and yeah. he worshiped in that form yeah. He, yeah. they wanted that they should that shiva should give a, a, a glimpse of him to them okay. so okay. so shiva was in rabhirishi ashram and yeah. then he sent he one of his gun birbhadra and birbhadra was the person who was uh, just has been narrated or depicted as a hari hari means also jala Yeah, and okay. that that part of uh, water is very very wide and very very uh, undangerous you can say very fruitful also bhadra mahabhadra when sang called ganga mahabhadra and even in the during the excavation of uh, the canal uh, that seal is being kept in victoria albert museum where late gupta uh, uh, period seal has been found in which uh, the the name of this region has been uh, uh, written uh, shri bhadra vinup shri bhadra okay. vinup vishay pradhikaranasya so that okay. water is very auspicious okay. and now madam i want to just narrate you this is uh, mentioned in the skand puran and that hari form of shiva yeah the form of virbhadra and his consort is bhadrakali so you have seen the Uh, the chineshwar kali temple uh, you are very right in uh, narrating this fact that uh, uh, this type uh, this kind of shiva is very much popular in uh, south india so kamraj just uh, uh, got a glimpse of that region and there is a very beautiful temples on the other uh, side of the ganga near uh, the foothills of uh, chandi devi parvat okay. so that is bhadrakali and that is also very auspicious so yeah. this is the uh, uh, narration what i want to add and the other thing what about because you have just escaped that part i want to uh, bring back to that part because that bilkeshwar parvat from where that river lalita is being emerging mm -hmm. where the story of tapsa parvati is narrated in the puranas mm -hmm. because she uh, uh, she uh, was in that forest for long time to appease lord shiva to <laughs> find him as her husband and we have a beautiful image of uh, this narration in our museum okay and i want to uh, say you because this is very interesting because nobody knows about this fact the goddess lalita yeah. is very much worshiped in haridwar 
it is a goddess of nitya kriya and it is a goddess uh, of uh, boon giving and uh, people from time immemorial gathered here and they wanted to just get a shun or doubts uh, by worshipping this goddesses that's why okay. i wanted to uh, know much about this goddess okay and, thank you uh, you told yeah yes. so, so you told me a lot like, about yeah yeah so these are the information i wanted to yes. share because thank i you. asked sonali was with me in the excavation of rakhi gadi just two decades back two and half decades back so uh, i <laughs> today also i requested her to just give a link of your lecture because yeah, i so, very much raised that so if you are a close friend i am a very close friend of hans bakker so can i have your full name please because i will be writing my name is him. my name is manoj kumar he has mentioned my about my our excavation at ganeshampur and uh, the world of askan quran quran has also been mentioned yeah 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 i, and, I will definitely yeah, write to him yeah, i will write yeah, to him yeah. okay Yeah, now he so is much. working on the hunas. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. I, Thank you, Madam. I, I must. Yeah, I, ah, I yes. must congratulate you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And I think this Thank is uh, uh, just because of you know uh, history and archaeology, of course. And I think with the uh, you know excavations and uh, the importance of myths, I think uh, I feel yeah. that uh, if one excavates. Um, you know the, the whole space and time factor we can actually kind of understand these myths better about you yes know, yes yes and see whether you have those kind of uh, uh, that kind of evidence which speaks absolutely about conflicts uh, in their personal piety or uh, temple yeah. architecture or things like that absolutely absolutely yeah 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 absolutely uh, let's take one more question uh, uh, ritu has a question okay yeah. hi again um, See, I just wanted to ask your view in this because a lot of pundits have their own view. When we do the linga puja, when we do the abhishek, jal chadhate hain jab shivling par. So there is a is there a particular sequence? We okay, start with Ganesha. I am uh, <laughs> very sorry. Actually, I am not really. I have to confess, not a practitioner. Uh, okay. And I, I don't. I know that there are uh, there are details given in the Purans regarding how the water should be kept. But I do find that it's done the how the Abhishekha. It's mentioned differently in different Purans. But uh, I would definitely think that all pundits will have. Everybody may not be homogeneous about this. They might have different ideas Correct. about how to do it. So uh, I'm really sorry. I just study Shiva from the historical point of view and uh, and some art. So I'm not very knowledgeable. I don't want That's to. That's okay. Wrong. I just wanted to know your view. That's perfectly I fine. Have, I, I don't want to give wrong information. No, so sorry. that's okay. Perfectly fine. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, before we end, I want to tell you that um, I, I'm so glad so many questions were asked, and uh, yes. you know, just um, uh, last year I, I went into the village where uh, okay. I want to share it with everyone. Uh, okay. Both these uh, uh, sculptures were out of context, but just placed randomly at the Shiva temple, and then yes, uh, yes. I took uh, some villagers who were there. I said, okay, from one to ten, these are all numbered. you tell me what yeah. are the things of these images and yes. I said, i'm not going to judge you whether you're right or wrong you just tell me yes. and then yeah. while they were doing it they called vishnu something else and they called kartik yes yes no yeah, which, which is fine also yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is fine like i said i didn't want to judge them but when they did that i was yeah. like okay you are uh, you know going on with this knowledge somebody told you and somebody told them so that's very important yeah. to me Yeah. 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 Transferred. And talking about yeah. narratives, uh, Dr. Molly Koshal, uh, she's been working on the Gaddis, the nomads. So she messaged me yes. that she would like to talk about the Shiva narratives of the Gaddis. Uh, she will be doing a talk soon, and I'm sure you would be okay. interested in that. That what the nomadic people of the Himalayas think about Shiva. Yes. And how do they uh, integrate yes. Yes. Shiva uh, to their life? And uh, definitely, uh, Shantanu has a question. Would you be willing to take another question? Okay, <laughs> okay, one more, <laughs> one okay. more. The last question. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, hi, hi, Sonali. Hi, ma'am. Ma'am, I have a question. Who created Shiva? Is Are there who Shantanu. created Shiva? Sorry, Shantanu. Oh, okay. Who created? No, he's asking who created Shiva. He's a god concept created by human beings, definitely. 
ideas and dreams, how, how gods get created, you know, through our own imagination, through our own thinking, through certain spiritual experiences. Um, because, you know, there's not one revelatory book. We all know that in Hinduism, we don't have that. Uh, it, and as I said, he got created over the centuries. There were so many of his traits which you don't see when he first, we first see him. So I don't know who created him. How can I say? I just wish that you might be. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a question that I can't answer, really. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to thank you. And before I let you go, I just have to make an announcement. On the 16th, which is Saturday at 10.30 a.m., we'll have Dr. Vilika Vendrick talk about community archaeology. Um, uh, she's the director uh, of yes. the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology at UCLA. She was uh, my PhD chair, so I love it when my professors come and uh, deliver a <laughs> lecture. I feel so... Thank you, Sonali. <laughs> Thank you, Sonali. You're a very, you're a very good ex-student. <laughs> now you're a friend, but you're a very, very good ex-student. I'm very, very happy that you asked me to come. Thank yeah. you. And Thank uh, you. so we'll have Dr. Vilika Vendrick on Saturday, the 16th. She'll be talking about her work in Egypt and Ethiopia. So those of you who okay. are not archaeologists, I would also urge you to still come because what she does with the community is very important. And as you know, as historians, as anthropologists, as people who are traveling. Yes. It's so important yeah. to connect with places we go, we visit, to know about the yes. culture, to know about the context, and to break those yes. barriers. And we yes. as academics are very, very, um, I think that chain is very important because we should not objectify right. these people, but integrate them in our research, not as objects, but as people. Yes. So yes. Uh, I really urge all of you to come and uh, Thank you so much for your lecture today. It has been, I told you, it will go on for a long time. <laughs> okay. Thank and you. Thank you, Sunali. I do want to extend an invitation again to you to speak on this platform about yoginis, about tantra, about Durga, <laughs> okay. about all these books that you okay. have written. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure I, um, everyone. God willing. <laughs> so, Shiva willing. <laughs> So thank really. you all and all of you are invited to uh, Kulu Valley. Please uh, come here and see some beautiful Shiva temples here. Uh, and uh, who knows, Dr. Chitkopikar might be teaching you all. <laughs> right? <laughs> right here. Thank you. Thank you and, very much. Thank and you. I will make so a lecture available soon. So okay. I recorded it. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Bye, bye, bye. Until we meet again. Bye, everyone. Yeah, bye, bye. 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 Okay.